right. All righty, we got some folks coming in. Hello, good after, good officially good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for another edition of Sustainable in the City. Uh, we're gonna get everybody in and then be beginning right around 12.03. Also, hey, Jen, on an idea that I had yesterday, and I guess I'll just stop sharing my ideas uh, after this, but um, I was on a call and there was someone playing music. So something to think about. Not going to start playing music right now, but an idea for the future. I think in the chat, we do have a chat mm -hmm. feature, y'all, if you want to mm -hmm. put in some ideas for us on what kind of music. I mean, there's so many options, but I think that's yeah. a great idea. Um, yeah. it, it was, please sing for us, Patrick, Julie. No, we're, we're trying to keep people here to learn, not have them running for the hills. See, I just immediately go to Jeopardy. That's the first thing that happens. That's whenever I think of hold music. Mm -hmm. but uh, how about people... Happy by Pharrell Williams? Excellent recommendation, Allison. Excellent. I love Pharrell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I typically go to just jazz, so I'll probably say La Vie and Rose by Louis Armstrong. Ooh, oh, there you go. Something calming. Nobody doesn't like that. Was that? Yeah, it's super calming. And everybody calming. loves jazz. I always wonder There's... how people do that successfully in those webinars, though. Have music? Yeah. I think Steely, Steely Dan's been suggested. I like Steely Dan. It came in as steel eye span, so I'm hoping I that figured was... it out. <laughs> yeah. I, I interpreted it as <laughs> no music. Music, okay. Oh, oh. Right. gotcha. Oh, ah, that's actually that's really great feedback. Yeah. We will now. I guess I maybe next music. Oh, the Vivaldi, yeah. Steel eye span is actually a band from the UK. Oh, I didn't know that. We all learned something. Yes. Yeah. Just the sound of birds chirping in nature. Get us in the in the groove or in the vibe. Jennifer, are you talking about the sound of trees, perhaps? Yes. What's uh, happening yes. in the trees? They're whistling in the wind. Now that is a beautiful segue right there. Uh <laughs> Ooh, I got a YouTube video. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Um, if you are just joining us, we are going to be beginning shortly uh, while we debate whether or not we should have music at the start of these programs. But you are here joining us for another session of Sustainable in the City. Um, we're going to give it maybe one more minute uh, and then we're going to get started. And actually, I'll just go ahead and do a brief introduction. Um, so yes, you are here for another edition of Sustainable in the City, Thinking Upstream. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for creating a smart yard, composting, pollution prevention, and planting native. Uh, we'll be beginning shortly, but there are a few reminders to go over before we get started, first and foremost. Uh, if you are not subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do so now. If you just go to our YouTube, Urban Green Lab, just click the bell to subscribe. Uh, you will have access to all of our previous uh, Sustainable in the Cities and our future Sustainable in the Cities. It's going to all be there so you can catch up, share with your friends. Um, so yes, just go to YouTube, Urban Green Lab, click the bell to subscribe. Um, and you can like us on social media as well. We are at Urban Green Lab and at Nashville Z Metro Nashville Zero Waste on all the major social platforms. Uh, if you can just follow us, you'll be able to keep up with all the relevant news and updates. Uh, and one more thing, Urban Green Lab is a nonprofit. So if you feel so inclined to support the work that we do, uh, you can head on over to our website, www.urbangreenlab.org, uh, click the donate button, or on your smart device, you can text Team UGL to 44321 and get a donation link sent to your phone. Uh, now, with that all out of the way, I am going to pass it off to my co-hostess with the mostest, Jen Harmon. All right. Thanks, Patrick. And welcome, everybody. I am so excited. We have so many folks here today, and I am super, super excited to talk about trees and yards and sustainability. Getting out in the spring, it is that time of year to start thinking about getting back in the yard again. 
Um, so I'm really super excited to also have two of some of my very favorite people to talk with you today about all of this. So we've got Julie Berbilia, which uh, she is the education specialist at Metro Water Services. She's also a regular host on Nashville Public Television's Volunteer Gardener. So maybe you've seen her around there and she focuses on community environmentally friendly gardens. She's also a master gardener um, and my favorite person to ask all my gardening questions to. Um, so we've got her with us and we've also got Jennifer Smith, one of my colleagues. She is Nashville's city horticulturist, uh, horticulturist uh, within Public Works here with our department under the Beautification and Environment Commission. Um, she's the coordinator of the Metro Tree Advisory Committee and in her work, she helps to sustain our street trees and coordinates with the local tree nonprofit organizations here in Nashville. Um, so I am gonna go ahead and we are gonna jump in and get started talking about trees. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so we can share our faces and welcome everybody. And don't forget, if you do have questions, throw them in the chat. Patrick is gonna be monitoring that chat. Um, we're, we used a Q&A &A last time and it was all over the place. So we're going with just the chat today. Um, so throw any questions that you have and if you have technical issues, do send those to Patrick as well. But we're going to go ahead and get started. So our first question is, um, I just want to know, want you both to talk a little bit about yourself and how your role intersects with sustainability. So Jennifer, I'm going to throw that one to you first. Thank you. I grew up in Nashville and as a young one, I volunteered at Cheekwood to pull weeds. And I just love being there in the gardens and public horticulture just kind of got into me then. So I went on to get my degree in horticulture and landscape design in uh, the College of Agriculture at UT. And since then, I've, I really feel blessed to have had the jobs I've had working in botanic gardens and then being the director for many years of the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council, which is a statewide organization. And after that, um, I became, as um, Jen was saying, the horticulturalist here at Metro Public Works. And it has just been a dream job for me. And trees do make a difference. That's my bumper sticker. Trees are the answer to everything. Um, and I really enjoy working with all the nonprofits and getting involved with volunteers that give of themselves to the community. And planting trees, I think, is, is the best way, um, planting and caring for them is the best way, um, I think, to be a good citizen. Great. Julie? Oh my gosh, so Jennifer, you have uh, raised so many things in my mind. Um, the tree thing made me think about climbing trees as kids. Uh, one summer, the big thing in Louisiana was a kid fell off out of the tree and broke his arm. It was very exciting. Um, anyway, so um, let's see, but what else? Oh, just, just the fun of nature um, and also the challenges of nature because one of my grandmothers um, lived in uh, Texas and she had a beautiful garden of cactus and it was cactus and rocks and it was amazing but we would go out there to um, look at the flowers when they flowered and of course they stuck us everywhere so you know it was sort of you know nature is is complicated we learned from that my other grandmother lived in mississippi and she had the most delicious fig tree mm, it's wonderful um so <laughs> Um, all of that, I don't know, I guess I, I sort of had that in my blood from early on. I uh, certainly didn't start out as a career in this. I started out doing um, civil liberties work and as that got to be really hard and as I got sort of burnt out, I decided to go from um, fighting for peace and justice to fighting for peas and justice, environmental justice. Okay, everybody laughed. Excellent. Okay, that's great. I love it. Oh, quiet down, everybody. Um, the roaring, roaring laughter. Um, no, I uh, worked at an organic garden in the city at Scarrett Bennett for a while. I um, have worked uh, at Croft Middle School to work on their environmental program when they started. And then I've been um, really, really fortunate to fall into a couple of different places in the city doing compost education years ago um, at Metro Public Works and way prior to Jen, and uh, then ending up over where I am now at Metro Water Services. And our interest in all of this is, is not just because, you know, I'm like 
pulling the interest with me because I, I must have the dirt in the gardening. Um, that is partially true. But um, the big deal for us really is that, you know, what's more sustainable or needs to be more sustainable than the city's water and a city like Nashville that's blessed with water all over the place, something we need to take care of. So, um, and I did spend a um, good bit of yesterday getting dirty. So, all right. So it's very clear that we have two very passionate uh, panelists with us today, but also definitely some experts. So they know what they're talking about. So as we go along, do as you get questions, put those in the chat, but we're gonna start off with kind of what brought us to this panel today, why we wanted to have you. So we're gonna get at the heart of all of this. All right, so I wanna first talk about the relationship between our own yards and our community because what we do at home can have consequences that go beyond the property line. So in what ways can, we, uh, can what we do at home have an impact on the greater Nashville community and either positive or negative? So we'll start with Julie. Oh, well, I brought a picture to show everybody, but before I show you this wonderful picture, what I want you to think about is what happens when it rains on your house. Well, it rains on your house and we all know rain goes downhill, right? So it's got to go somewhere if it's leaving your property. Um, and it's gonna go downhill and in Nashville, it's going to hit a creek, stream, river or lake somewhere, not too far from you, honestly. So now think about all of the stuff that might be on your yard or might be on your driveway, everything from, litter and trash. Um, oh, hey, Jen, speaking of litter and trash, not being able to recycle things. Um, I found a chip bag the other day and I was really upset because it looked like the chips were really good. It was empty and I did not eat them. So they came from somewhere else, which upset me in so many ways. They were good chips. I didn't get them and there was litter. Well, how did the litter get to my yard? Well, you know, we all recognize the wind blew it onto my yard from somewhere else. Well, what we don't realize is when that rain courses over our yard, that it takes our trash, even pollution we can't see, uh, like lawn chemicals and stuff, and it takes it somewhere. So just like the wind blows, the water moves stuff from here to there. So let's see what that means for homeowners. So now I'm going to share with you my pretty picture. And all right, Patrick, give me a nod. Always give me a smile. It must be working. Excellent. Okay, so this is fascinating. So this is all of Tennessee. I wanted to bring all of Tennessee into this. Um, look at this. Okay, you can see there's a lot of water in Tennessee. Um, and yes, it looks like a circulatory system and you can think of it as Tennessee's circulatory system. All those red and blue lines are rivers, streams, and creeks. And the ones that are red are ones that have issues that people have caused with pollution. Now I've highlighted on this bar on this uh, pie chart, just a few things that really can come from our very own yard. So all of us gardeners, you know, uh, we're gonna start to slap ourselves around here. So um, sediment, that's going to be, you know, just plain soil that's running off our yards or running off construction sites, um, headed to the waterways, it can choke out fish. Um, Nutrients and bacteria that can be from our dogs, ick, um, along with pathogens. Um, nutrients can be from fertilizer and just changing vegetation, ripping stuff out, especially around creeks and streams can cause a lot of uh, problems in our streams. So there we go, but we don't want to uh, make you feel really, really bad. So I'll quit sharing that. Uh, but that's why we're into it at Metro Water Services is because, you know, just like the wind blows trash from your yard, every time it rains, it can be taken pollution away from your yard as well. Awesome. Uh, well, not awesome, unfortunate. Um, but that's why we're, we're going to learn more about this. Um, Jennifer, I'm going to turn it over to you to answer that question and talk about um, yeah, how things intersect at our home with the, the greater natural community. Well, trees are beautiful. We all know that. We think of it as our hometown. It's a town with trees, uh, street line trees, um, but they're, they're working for us. These trees are doing so much value added to our community. And I just want to review some of those. They improve our air quality by reducing the temperature. So just think um, when you reduce the temperature, um, 
you're able to um, not use as much air conditioning, let's say at your home, that's uh, absorbing, uh, you know, helping with cost. And they remove air pollutants by uh, absorbing the little particulate matters in their trunk and on their leaves. Um, and then of course, they produce oxygen. So how cool is that? Um, they uh, sequester carbon, that's the, you know, the, the wood, and that helps be a carbon sink. Um, and that can help. We have here um, as much as 48 pounds of carbon dioxide per year can be sequestered. Um, one ton of carbon dioxide by the time it reaches 40 years old. So that they're really out there working for us. Um, again, they help uh, mitigate what we call a heat island effect and climate change. I think um, if, if I asked what's one thing can you do to mitigate the climate issues we're having, a simple plant tree could not be any simpler than that. Um, flood control, we'll probably get into that a little bit later, but um, you know, trees, um, their roots absorb water and physically the tree, when the rain comes down, it hits the, the branches and the leaves and then it trickles down to our earth and helps prevent uh, soil erosion, which um, goes back to water quality. Um, so they help reduce noise, they absorb uh, noise and they're, it's directly related to mental health. People who see and witness uh, nature and walk out in the woods, have um, better frame of mind. So it's mental health, um, increase our property values, um, places that have trees um, do a lot better, um, either their property values higher or they're, um, like if they're trying to rent something, it rents quicker. So all these things go directly back to quantifying the values of trees. And in early childhood development, um, the cognitive development um, in working memory is increased when school children are in um, the um, you know, environment with trees. So um, anyway, you, you slice it up, trees uh, are the answer. And um, in the communities that have um, trees, there is less crime. That's been uh, documented as well. Is, I just find all of it so fascinating, just how much just a tree and can do for our community. So, um, so as we'll move on to our next question, as Nashvillians are starting to plan their garden, so that's kind of why we had this have this uh, right now. You're starting to plan your gardens, your plantings. Um, this year, I've I've often heard to plant native. Um, so, what does it mean to plant native? How does planting native contribute to a smart, sustainable yard? And what advice do you have for choosing what to plant and where? Uh, we will start with Jennifer. So um, this is something that's just right up my alley and I love talking about this. Um, so a native tree or plant, let's, I'll digress to trees, but just plants in general um, are the ones that occur naturally in a particular region without human introduction. So we didn't bring it from Asia, let's say over here. Um, and it's also uh, has a nice relationship with the native wildlife. So they coexist, they co-evolve together and that's gonna be important to note. So why plant native? Um, they've adopted to the local climate and soil condition uh, where they naturally occur. And that's important um, so that the wildlife, they provide nectar, pollen, seeds and other food sources um, for the native butterflies, insects, birds, and other animals. So that, that symbiotic relationship between our wildlife and our native plants is very important to the health of our biodiversity and our, our systems here. So um, many of the plants um, that we've, we landscape with, ornamental type plants that would come from, let's say, Asia, they, um, they did not coexist or co-evolve with our, our wildlife here. So they don't really have the right kind of food source. Um, and they also, um, in order to live, often require insecticides and uh, pesticides. So the, some of the things to be aware of there. Um, also, our native plant material doesn't require as much uh, supplemental water. And um, that's important because um, then you could also have um, stormwater runoff because of that when you have to maintain your, um, your landscape plants that aren't native. So, um, and also our native plants tend to have longer uh, root systems. 
which actually is uh, aerating and helping our quality of our soils here. So there's many reasons. Um, and just an uh, interesting fact that um, the less lawn you have, okay, so if you um, want to shrink your lawn and plant more native plants, the, the um, motors, the gas motors of our um, garden equipment, whether it's for hedge that you have to um, prune uh, or mow grass, it uh, accounts for 5% of air pollution in the United States. So right there, it's an air quality issue as well. Um, but just, um, there, there's so many wonderful uh, native plants. Uh, there's a whole host. Um, like all the different oaks, uh, many are native to Tennessee. Our eastern red cedar, I want to point that out because it's a um, evergreen, um, when you're looking for evergreen native. Um, the hornbeam, American hornbeam, the eastern red bud, the service berry, the American hazelnut, all these are, are, are important and favorites. And I got, let's see, I'm going to work this here. Just a few things to show, planting trees to conserve energy. So um, you see the uh, left side that these evergreens, if you plant the evergreens on the north side, they protect the house from winter winds. And that really can reduce your um, energy savings in the winter. Um, and uh, in the summer, your trees, if you plant them strategically um, to protect them from the summer sun, um, and also to cover uh, windows or your air conditioning unit, that can really cut down on the, the amount of energy used. And here in the winter, you see the um, deciduous leaves fall off and the sun can get into your house uh, and warm it. So it's, it's really important um, to be mindful and strategic when you're where to plant um, your trees. Just to let you know, NES, our electric service, has put together this uh, right tree in the right place, and it's on their website and on uh, trees.nashville.gov. And you can just look to see if you want to uh, plant a large, medium, or small size tree and how far away that needs to be from the electric power lines so that you look up when you're deciding where to plant a tree um, and you say, hmm, I want to plant a large tree. I better plant it um, at least 45 feet away from the power lines. No uh, tree or shrub should be within 10 feet of the power line, and that's really important. Sometimes people complain, oh, that tree looks funny because it has a, the V cut where the line goes through or the L cut, um, but that's sustainable for that tree, and it keeps the structural integrity of that tree intact, um, but it is just simply the wrong tree for the wrong place. Um, so, planting a tree in Nashville, Tennessee, we have a video that we produced, I think it was just last year, and it's about seven or eight minutes long, and that would save you so much time if you could take the effort to watch that. And um, there are safety considerations and growing considerations that are highlighted in this. But if I'm asked often, um, which I am, what happened to this tree, it died. Um, one of the things um, we also have at our website, trees.nashville.gov, these planting guidelines. And, and one thing, I'm not going to go into all detail, but one thing um, to note is if that trees' uh, roots actually breathe. And if you plant them too deep, then those roots are trying to grow up to get the oxygen and they'll start circulating um, and growing too, too above ground. So you want the top of the root ball where the roots come out to be two inches above ground. So we have a diagram on the bald and burlap tree, as well as a diagram on the um, container grown tree. So um, those are just some of the considerations of why, why you should consider planting native. Um, do something crazy, plant native. Julie? This is excellent information. I love it. Um, so native. Um, wow. It's hard to even know where to start, but I want to start with this idea that um, you mentioned about co-evolving, about native plants and native animals co-evolving. So 
I want to bring us back to that um, because there are a lot of plants that we might love or we've learned to love because we've seen them and, and we have the abilities and people have always, always, always been able to uh, bring plants and have loved bringing strange plants from one place to the other. And um, that, uh, I guess I'll, I'll say tentatively that has its place, but you need to be careful. But what happens with all of that? Well, you might have something that is non-native that isn't invasive, it's not taking over and you think that's fine. But go out this summer and throughout the year and look carefully at that beautiful plant. Is anything chewing on it? Is it getting any insect damage? Well, you might think it's fantastic to have because there's no insect damage occurring. Well, actually, that's unfortunate. And the reason that's unfortunate is that means that it's not really serving a place in the ecosystem. So plants are food for something. And the things that eat them, the caterpillars and such that eat on them are going to be food for something else. So it works like this, native insects, eat native plants, native birds, eat native bugs. And if you're missing something in that whole food web, then we're going to find that we're going to lose more and more of those native animals. So this is why it's really important to take a look at native plants. And in fact, I was, um, I think it's Doug Tallamy, who's written a lot on the subject, who has said that, um, the, uh, the research right now is saying that you need about 70% of your yard in natives to support certain types of, of birds or animals. So, so that's worth really thinking about. And again, that's a balance. That's a really nice balance. But I also want to come back to a tree that someone mentioned in the chat, uh, hackberries. Okay, I see, I can just feel people going, oh, with hackberries. But I love hackberries. One, I think they're really cool looking. Um, and I know a lot of stuff falls from them, but that stuff is, is food for something. Uh, they're great wildlife trees. But I do agree that they can be a problem if you're not putting the right plant in the right place. So you know you don't want a hackberry right where you're going to be parking under it unless you just love cleaning stuff off your car all the time. Um, you may not want it really close to a house because there are bits and pieces of it that fall all the time. But hackberries have their place in the ecosystem. And, and this is something and I'm sure, see Jennifer uh, nodding her head over there, but this is something we all need to think about with trees is when they have their place and what that place is and does it fit with what you're doing in your yard. But natives, Absolutely love them, love going out and looking at them, love to see the things eating them. I now get excited when something is eating my plants. Uh, so that actually is a great transition into my next question. Julie, I think you might've hit on this a little bit already. So no matter what you plant, every yard can create a habitat for a great variety of wildlife. What are some best practices when it comes to encouraging wildlife like birds and butterflies, as well as deterring pests? Oh my. Nothing. Yep, Julie, I'm throwing that back to you. Okay, excellent. So encouraging wildlife and deterring pests. Well, this leads me to my favorite story from last summer. Yeah, I'm going with it, it's my favorite. Um, so I grow, I like to grow some canis because they're pretty. And one thing that happens though is a leaf borer insect gets to them and, or a leaf roller. And what it does is what it sounds like, it rolls up the leaf. So it eats a long part of it and it makes it roll up. And that's where then that larva starts to grow and then it eats its way out and gets bigger. So it really does a number on the leaves. And it's also, I have to admit, sort of fun to go and, and unroll the leaves. You have to sort of unstitch them because they're stitched up with this silk stuff they produce. So I was out there one day, you know, sort of uh, saying bad words and unrolling the leaves. And all of a sudden I unrolled one and poof, out popped a little green tree frog who I'd only ever seen in my vegetable garden before. And I looked at him and he looked at me and I think he said some really bad words and I tried to fold the leaf back over him and I went about my business. 
not really thinking too much about it. And then I unrolled a few more leaves and boom, I found another little frog. And at this point, I thought, I need to think about this. What's happening here? And I realized, ah, I have created a little frog thing, a little frog uh, uh, food chain here. So what's going on? So later on, I looked it up and that little larva in there, the leaf roller turns into the Brazilian skipper butterfly. And that is its host plant is that cana and the little frogs like it. Okay, so I have a whole different relationship now with that plant going on and with that little rolling thing. In fact, I think maybe I should get a tattoo of it or something. But uh, anyway, that's a whole other thing. But I think it's very, very cool. And I came to realize, okay, these things grow like crazy. And so if they're being a little stunted back because there's food chain going on, that's fine with me. Okay, so, but looking at other things. So what about parts of the garden that, um, you know, I'm trying to eat off of? What am I gonna do about that? Well, one of the really cool things I learned from Master Gardeners a couple of years ago was about planting buckwheat near tomatoes as they got started. And the reason is because it makes these teeny tiny little flowers and the tiny little flowers in buckwheat will attract insects that are predatory insects. So they can get in there and they can sort of fight it out with the insects that are after the tomatoes and some of the other plants. So attracting more insects is a great way to let nature get everything all balanced out. Um, and then there's this funny thing I read about my last thing here, and I, this is the funniest thing I read on Facebook, I think last year, really and truly plant related anyway. And that is um, a whole group that was dedicated to tomato hornworms and um and in other nature but what they uh suggested you do is you take them off the tomatoes you're eating that you want to grow for eating and you grow more tomatoes and you have a patch for the hornworms so they can finish their lifestyle i thought that was very interesting and if anyone wants to know somewhere out there there is a facebook page where people grow the hornworms on purpose to feed to their lizards so um pests try to be as natural about it as you can. If you have to hand pick them, you can move them, you can send them on your way, um, but try to be gentle with that and understand you don't have to nuke everything out there to death and have a perfect garden because as, as we say with our, we have a Tennessee Smart Yards program. And one thing we say about that is that um, it really is unrealistic and, um, and just probably unwise to strive for the perfect yard where nothing is eating anything. What about you, Jennifer? Well, I'm back to trees. That's my answer to everything. <laughs> of course you expected that, right? <laughs> so um, yeah, so trees are a host to a lot of our native um, uh, insects, bugs, if you will, wildlife. Um, and just think about this. Um, the bird population has dropped by 3 billion, that's a B, across North America. An overall decline of 29% since 1970. So we need to make sure we have that food source for our chickadees, our birds. Um, so 90% of the birds uh, feed their young with the caterpillars and um, they're looking to our native uh, trees for that resource. Um, the caterpillars are just that perfect little package, soft package of fat and protein that they can just drop down the little chickadees' uh, throats to feed them. And that's really important if we're going to you know, keep our population going of our birds. Um, oak trees, um, and we have so many native oak trees in, in Tennessee, um, they support 534 different butterflies and moths. So when we're losing our tree canopies, we're losing that, those habitats. Um, and we are losing our tree canopies, as you all know, just to um, growth, development, diseases, other kinds of declines. So some of the top uh, trees to um, provide food for our um, insects and birds are the oaks and the cherries, the elms, the native willows, the hackberry julie, serviceberry, and pawpaw. 
Um, and so those are things, uh, there's uh, websites that we are gonna be listing are great to say what trees attract the most, um, you know, are best for the wildlife. Um, even um, the, uh, the butterfly, you know, that it lays its, its eggs on the leaves and bark of, of um, trees way up high and we can't see them, but when they hatch, the larvae, they come out and they start eating um, the leaves of the tree. It's, again, they co-evolve, so they don't destroy that tree. If they're so high up, we probably don't even see it with our eyes. But um, that's another, you know, they, they provide the shelter for these um, moths and butterflies and insects during bad weather. And um, they can be protective up there, perched during, during the middle of the day when it's so hot. So um, for the sake of our birds and frogs and other insects, um, we have to have trees. I rest my case. So this brings us to our next question. Yard maintenance can include a whole host of pesticides, fertilizers, weed killer, and other chemicals. So should we be using those products? Are there better alternatives, such as some of the organic products that are out there? And what do we need to know about using these products to be more sustainable? And I will throw that one to Julie first. Oh, yay. Okay, so first of all, I want everybody to, to be really clear on a couple of things. Just because it is rated organic or something that people have done for, you know, or mixed up or created for hundreds and hundreds of years, doesn't mean it's going to be safe for everything. So let's start with the basics, say a pesticide. Well, a pesticide is anything that is going to kill bugs, right? It's gonna kill a pest or, or other pests. So it's going to kill, even if it's organic, it's going to kill something. And so you need to keep that in your mind. Whatever it is that you're using, it can be something you can overuse. I think this comes along the, the whole discussion of, of anything that natural is, is everything that's natural good for you, but it's all a matter in the dosages, right? Because um, you, can, you can certainly overdo it with anything. You can overdo it with water, for example, uh, for yourself or for your plants. Uh, so the same thing with all of these things that we might see now or look to now when we want to do something good, we want an alternative to synthetic um, types of products, especially for pesticides or herbicides for that matter, to get rid of uh, what we consider weeds. So first of all, if you really need to use these, then do your research first. You know, nothing horrible is going to happen if you wait a little bit and make sure you really understand what you're doing. Um, what you want to do if you have a product you want to use is you need to read the directions. I know we need to read the directions. I see Jennifer like nodding and nodding. <laughs> it's true. Just because a little bit is the right amount does not mean that a whole lot is better. What happens to all that extra stuff that you might put down? So you're supposed to put down a teaspoon of something mixed with water and instead you mix a cup of it with the gallon of water. What's gonna happen? Well, it might kill a lot more stuff than you were out to target. And if it's going to, you know, if it rains anytime soon, then all of that extra is going to run from your house through the storm drain system or through the ditches. It's gonna run downhill like we were talking about at the beginning and it's going to end up in the waterways. Now, remember how I showed you that map and we're all really close to waterways. Well, think about that. Those streams sort of start at your house in a way, right? Cause the water's running off of there. And so next time, um, if you have to look for a pesticide, um, look at it very carefully. And if it says don't use near waterways, look very, very carefully as to how close you might be. Because those things can be very dangerous to aquatic critters. And then most importantly, of course, you don't want to put it down a storm drain. No, no, no. Because that's like injecting it straight in there. So, so yeah, so that's a big deal is be careful. What do we really recommend? Well, really good practices come from 
putting the plants in the right place to begin with because they're going to be healthier, like Jennifer was saying, making sure they get what they need. Um, if you're stressing them out, just like people, if you're not feeding them enough, um, meaning, you know, you don't have good soil or you haven't tested your soil and you're not sure what they might need or you're not giving them the right amounts of water too much or too little, or if you're overfeeding them with fertilizer, you can end up with plants that just aren't going to do well. And you might think, ooh, they're attracting bugs. I need to do more and more and more. Um, but maybe, in fact, you've weakened the plant so much by not knowing what it really needs. So being very careful. Thinking again, before you use anything, if everybody would just take a moment and think, okay, are those extra cucumbers I might get if I blast all these bugs away with this, uh, with whatever I'm using as a pesticide, if you choose to do that, is getting rid of all those cucumber beetles worth whatever maybe was eating them? And, and sort of think about that balance. It's a hard balance, I'll admit sometime. Um, let's see, uh, squash, squash bugs, uh, grow squash bugs really well, can't grow squash, worth a darn around here. You know, maybe you can, maybe you can't. So what does that mean? That means that, um, you know, I still try every year and I maybe get one squash and then I'm really excited. So um, yeah, I think it's all a balance is more and more how I'm looking at it. I see people agreeing in the chat about zero pesticide use. Um, and again, get to know the little critters. Um, and I want to share one other thing, and this would be the slap myself around thing. But for years, I have on and off made little sticky traps. So you take something yellow, something plastic and yellow usually, so it'll hold up, and you um, or a piece of yellow paper and cover it with uh, you know a plastic bag or something, and you put something sticky on it, oil or Vaseline or something, you stick it out in the yard. Well, I did that hoping to get cucumber beetles. No, I went out there last year and looked really, really closely, and I had these little bitty pollinators on there. I felt very bad, very, very bad. I pulled them all off and decided it wasn't worth it. So I'm going with balance. All right, Jennifer, do you have anything else to add about pesticides, weed killers, all those chemicals and trees? I do. I think it's really sad when you see a waterway um, that fertilizer has run into um, and there's that excess algae and the depletion of oxygen and what that does to our fish and wildlife and, and plants. So really be intentional if you have to use um, any of the pesticides or herbicides. But one thing that um, I've been talking a lot about in um, Nashville is the emerald ash borer. And we believe we have about 1.6 million ash trees in Davidson County. And unless they're treated, they will die. It's as simple as that. Um, we have a whole seminar, webinar. Um, the next one is on February 25th on this. It's our lunch and learn type program. But um, it looks so innocent. You see here the pretty um, boar and it's small and it's uh, started in from we believe Asia came over to Michigan. It's ground zero and it um, arrived in Davidson County in 2014. So this is what it looks like. Um, again, the, the webinar goes through a lot of details, but um, it has this leaflet and the branches are opposite and has this beautiful diamond shaped bark. It's quite sad that we're gonna lose all of our trees unless they're treated. But um, treatment to ash trees, um, is something of consideration. At this point, um, people can let them die, but they have a tendency to, do you see over, see in this middle picture here? Um, they could snap, it's called the ash snap at the base. So you have to make a plan on your management for, for the ash tree. Um, before now, people could do the soil drench or bark spray, but now um, it's the epidemic is further along that you have to inject it right into the live tissue so it goes straight up um, to, to where the leaves are. And so this is one chemical injection. Um, now that only lasts for two years. So you have to do it for every two years for the healthy life of that tree. But um, it, 
ash trees are wind pollinated, so they're real, they they bloom early in the spring, and the bees aren't the ones that are pollinating. It's wind pollinated, so that's a consideration um, there. And um, I'm gonna stop sharing. But again, that's uh, February 25th at, at 12 noon. We do a whole presentation on the emerald ash borer. Um, and so instead of using chemicals too, you can physically eradicate you know, your honeysuckle and privet and other things that you don't want in your yard too. Um, and uh, gives you some good exercise. Sometimes I've, I have friends who have a chemical for everything and they're, they're looking at me and I'm like, oh, you have to have some tolerance. You know, you're not gonna, I don't know if you're wanting to be the yard of the month or something, but, you know, uh, especially our native trees, you know, if a bug eats on it a little bit, it's okay. It's not going to die. And so you, you don't have to come out with, you know, the fertilizers and all. Um, so in general, native plants don't need it. Um, they can tolerate just a little of uh, their leaves being eaten. Um, but embrace nature and try not to get rid of it. Insects are essential to preserve the biodiversity of our environment. And that's such an important takeaway from this whole um, presentation today. Um, so try to get uh, such plants that grow in the area um, where they evolve, that backs that native. All right. It's just, it just chill. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's what I do with my yard and I've got all kinds of bugs and crawling things all over it and I am just fine with it. Um, okay, we've got two more questions. I know we're running a little short on time, but I wanna get through just a couple more things here. Um, so here at Public Works, um, I have to bring it up. One of our biggest uh, programs is learning how to compost in your backyard at home to reduce your food waste. Um, contact me if you wanna know more all about that piece of it. But compost, of course, also creates a natural soil amendment. That's why it's so great. You reduce your food waste while creating this great product for your yard and for your soil um, to create healthy soil. So can you both talk a little bit about best practices for using compost, but then also what are other ways really that we can create that healthy soil that I think Ju uh, Julie mentioned earlier in the program? How do we do this, this healthy soil at home? So I will throw it to you, Julie, first. Oh, okay. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the composting because let's see, I have right here, in my reusable bag, I have part of my lunch. I have my mandarin orange peels and um, yeah, <laughs> napkins. So nice. yeah, it's going home to my compost. I've yeah packaged it. Okay, so um, yeah, so besides getting rid of your food waste, you know things are going to rot right there. You're going to have some control of what's going into your soil by composting. It's a great way to just um, reuse things that are on your land anyway. So um, while it's a great practice to just leave leaves on the ground because they'll have all kinds of critters, insects and so forth that are going to depend on them for that part of their lifestyle over the winter for, for that phase of their life. Um, if, you, if you are getting leaves, I leave mine on the ground and then I tend to go out and uh, pick up other people's, which is great, and uh, make my compost pile. So it's a way to, to sort of uh, steal things from public works, I like to think of it, and uh, save them, you know, and do what nature wants, is to let them rot. Um, so a cool thing about compost is, yeah, you're adding organic matter to your soil. And one thing we want everybody to remember is that all soil is not equal. And so even in your own yard, because of the fact that, you know, none of, none of that anymore is what most likely is what it originally was, and it hasn't been for a long time, depending on what's happened on that site over the years, uh, maybe there was construction fill, maybe it was um, run over, sure it was run over with a lot of construction vehicles at some point when uh, your house was built, who knows what's in some of that land, some of it might be clay, that's mine. Uh, some of it might actually be sand. Some of it might be chain link fence and brick oak blocks that you find buried. You don't know. So what do we really suggest you do before you go adding anything, including really lots and lots of compost? We want you to get a soil test. And the UT Ag Extension Service has their soil test lab here in Nashville. So you can always get a soil test and find out exactly 
what your soil needs. And so you get to become a bit of a, a soil scientist there. Um, so we do suggest people do that. Um, we want people very much to do that absolutely before they're going to add any kind of fertilizer to the soil so that you know, is it really, you know, are your plants really going to be hungry or not? What do you need? That's going to help a lot. Um, let's see, compost. Otherwise, yeah, there's great information about composting. Um, I do love the fact that you are keeping your own natural resources on your own property when you compost. Even if you do it really lazy, I've got a couple of those piles where it's just sort of piled in a corner, then, you know, there are a lot of native insects and native animals that are hanging out there. I've got uh, Opie the possum hanging out in mine, I think. Pretty sure he's out there and that's great because he eats lots and lots of ticks. That's one of the things possums do. Um, so yeah, oh, and uh, brush. I saw that brush is coming around my neighborhood, but there's some of the sticks I'm quickly breaking up and running back and throwing in my wood pile um, because that's where some of the wonderful native snakes hang out, which is great because they're not gonna bother me. They'll hang out there. So I think I touched on composting there. Yeah, and I'll just throw out there too. I saw somebody in the chat mention something about packaging up your leaves and bagging them up and putting them at the curb. Uh, plastic bag issue is a whole separate issue, but you know, one thing I try to do is, you know, the leaves, your grass, when you mow your lawn, leaving them on the lawn and letting that just do its thing and decompose naturally to, to help your soils. There's no reason to bag that up and take it to the curb. It's good for your, good for your soil. So, and for your lawn. So Jennifer though, I wanna throw it to you on, on yeah. healthy soils. Yeah, so just um, also note that when you're planting a tree, gotta go back to the trees, um, don't, when the soil you dig up is the soil you, you put back into the hole. Don't add compost or mulch um, into that hole. What that creates is I call the bathtub effect. And it's so nice and rich there that the roots will never go out into its new environment. And um, often causes the tree not to grow. So um, that's important. You can take your compost um, and add it lightly to your lawn every year um, and it helps build the soil. And Julie, you were talking about clay soil. We all suffer through that here. Um, and so anytime we can add organic matter to our soils and a light um, addition of compost, light addition to when we, we mulch every year. And annually, uh, the, the we need to, do this annually to our trees and shrubs and uh, our gardens because that breaks down every year and so that soil needs that that nutrient breakdown can you all see the uh, powerpoint now no um not sure why i'm not able to show that um any just anything jen uh click on that share screen that's what i'm not little share screen button it's gone away um do you want to run? Is it hovering to... down below? No. You hover your little cursor down below? It's not. It's not. Will you keep chatting? Yeah. Keep chatting. I will. All right. And um, luckily, her office is around the corner from mine. But um, basically, what we need to know is that the synthetic chemical fertilizer that we use, it, um, it, it feeds the plant. But what you really want is your organic fertilizer your compost to uh, feed the soil. So when you feed the soil, that's a natural way to um, feed your, your um, then it feeds your plants. So um, there we go. This is, I think, is a good diagram here to give you the concept of what we're trying to um, get across by using uh, compost, the organic fertilizer versus the chemical synthetic. All right, are we on to our next question? Yes, Sorry. yes, we are. You know, we we're down the hall from each other, so it worked out. Um, all right, last question, and we'll get into some of y'all's questions that you've been putting in the chat. I know there have been a lot of them. Um, so knowing that being sustainable in our yards is beneficial for everyone in the community, can you each talk about the programs that are available for residents to participate in to support that greater community effort here in Nashville? So 
such as uh, the Tennessee Smart Yards program, Julie, you had mentioned, and then also Metro Nashville through Nashville program. So I'll throw it over to uh, Jennifer first to talk about some of those programs and then Julie. So we're blessed in Nashville that we have a lot of F, uh, nonprofit groups and um, even within Metro government uh, efforts to sustain our um, green and our tree canopy. And so just want to get, give a few highlights. The Metro Tree Advisory Committee um, is a, a citizen based group that um, that helps um, advise the city, if you will, and they've um, about 37 years old. They've been around for quite some time. The um, Nashville Tree Foundation, they host many programs and do a lot of planting, but I just wanna bring your attention to the Green Shirt Volunteer Training Program. And um, you can go on their website and this is a leadership program to help um, train up volunteers that will be doing uh, plantings in the community. So for instance, uh, there might be on a given Saturday, a group that's gonna plant 200 trees and we have uh, done in a day volunteers show up, but those done in a day volunteers need oversight. And so when you go through this program, the green shirt, not only do you get that great, cool, comfortable green shirt, but you're, you're trained again to go out and uh, work with the uh, volunteers and it's quite rewarding. And there's a lot of fellowship uh, and brotherhood of the green shirts. Our city has a campaign called Root Nashville, and our goal is to plant a half a million trees by 2050. And any tree, whether you plant it, your neighbor plants it, or any of these nonprofits, you need to go to their website and dot your tree, and it will start counting on um, our uh, counter there. So it's a lofty goal, but it's so important that we maintain our, our tree canopy for all the benefits we talked about. Um, the Nashville Tree Conservation Corps, another nonprofit tree group, they have a tree cell that goes around throughout the year and it's um, very um, popular and it's a great way to get trees delivered to your yard where you can plant them or have them planted by someone else. And the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council, that was a group um, I mentioned earlier that I had been associated with that organization for quite a while working statewide. And just two other programs of note, they have the Arboretum Certification Program. There's over 120 Arboretum certified statewide. Um, and for your yard, they have this great program called the Tree Sanctuary, where you have to have at least 10 uh, tree species identified to become a sanctuary. And um, the Weed Wrangle, it's a uh, effort that was started here in Nashville about four years ago, four or five years ago. And it's a, a effort to have a invasive uh, like um, privet and honeysuckle removed from our forest. And it's actually gone to many st states and I, I, I believe one day it'll, it'll go nationwide and it started here. And um, if you've never wrangled before, it is great, it's fun, it's great exercise and you're making a difference. And um, there are many sites, it's usually um, in early March and you can go on their website and see what they're offering um, this year. And last but not least, the Tennessee Environmental Council has their uh, Tennessee Tree Day. And this year it's March 20th. Um, and you can go on their website and order tree seedlings. And they give away tens of thousands of, of, of seedlings um, that you can go pick up at their different locations across the state. So um, you can learn more about the costs associated with their seedlings on their website. So that's, that's a lot and I'll leave it back to Julie. Thanks, Jennifer. Julie, I know we've got like one minute before one. If you can swing that real quick and then we'll get over and spend a little extra time. So for those of you that do have to pop out, um, we will have the recording available for you so that you can watch. We're gonna stay on for a few more minutes to take some of your um, questions as well. Um, but Julie, go ahead and let us know a few about the Smart Yards program. Yes, so the Tennessee Smart Yards program, um, if you're now thinking, ooh, I wanna plant a tree, I wish I could get a free tree. Well, Root Nashville is very generously um, providing free trees during the next planting cycle um, to people who get 
their yard certified with this program, the Tennessee Smart Yards program. So you can go to that website and then we'll also make sure you all get a link to our next uh, workshop about it that we'll introduce you to it. But you can go to that website and get started today seeing if your yard uh, is smart I think we need a bumper sticker. My yard is smarter than your honor student. And um, because, you know, why not? And so there are all these different principles that you see here that we teach people about a lot of the stuff we um, touched on today. By the way, if you get your smart yard certified before or uh, by March 1st, then you'll qualify for the spring tree planting time. Um, and you can also Get a fine metal sign to put in your yard so that everybody knows your yard's smart, which is very cool. And this is what we want to do, though. We want to do more than just reach, you know, one person here has done something that, that helps the environment. One person here has done something, and, and you're reducing the pollutants that run off your lawn, and you're putting all your plants in the right place. We want other people to do it. We want to create entire communities. Um, so feel free to reach out to me, especially if you have a community garden that really wants to get involved in this type of thing and you want to really spread the word uh, to other people in that garden. We'd love to uh, work with you on that because we would like to see smart yards, smart schoolyards, smart community gardens, smart neighborhoods. That's what we're all here about. Awesome. All sustainable. Thanks so much, Julie. I am going to really quickly just uh, do our little wrap here. So basically what this comes down to is two things for you at home. What can you do to be more sustainable in your yard? Make it smart and plant and care for your trees. So these are some resources that have been shared. Um, we'll be sharing all of these different resources again, the email follow-ups as well. Um, so you're going to get this information. Don't feel like you have to furiously pull it from the chat. We're going to send it to you. Um, and we're going to go ahead and get into some questions. I want to share this screen because for those of you that do have to go, our next se session is February 24th. It's going to be fabulous. We have LaKendra Davis, who is the owner and executive chef of City Farm Company, uh, City Farm Co., and Julia Sullivan, who is the partner and chef at Henrietta Red, talking about eating local and local food systems. So don't forget to um, sign up for that event. That's going to be February 24th is our next session. But why don't we get into your questions? We're going to stick around for another 10 minutes or so for those of you that can stay with us and ask some questions to our panelists. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jen. Thank you to both of our panelists and thank you to everyone yes. who uh, attended today's session. Uh, we got a ton of questions, so I'm going to try and Quick fire them really quick here, but the first one comes from Margaret. Uh, do you all use rain barrels? I'm wondering if I should invest in them to water my garden this summer. Ooh, I'll jump in with rain barrels um, because I have a couple of rain barrels and I just feel like genius every time I use them. Um, why? Because, you know, it, gee, I just captured water. This is great. So, but, but what does this really do? Well, it does a couple of things. One, in terms of pollution prevention, when you catch water that's coming off of your roof, you now have some control over it. So you can not only use that water because you've captured it, but you also can go ahead and direct it to where you want. Remember, we started talking about that pollution that can flow off your property and, and end up going down a storm drain or down the street or something, picking up more pollution. But if you have a rain barrel and you actually leave it turned on when it rains, which sounds counterintuitive, but then say have a soaker hose or another hose and you're directing that water out into a nice spongy place in your yard, then your yard is able to use that water instead of that water running off your property. Um, otherwise, yeah, I love collecting water in my rain barrels and using it. So um, Metro Water Services has a sale every other year. I see someone asking about that. Um, that'll be 2022. Um, in the meantime, I understand Cumberland River Compact may still have a few, um, but also take a look. Um, and I hesitate to say this, but one, two, three, go. On Craigslist recently, I saw several people that had very large food grade barrels and you could make your own. So yeah, go for it. 
Excellent, thank you, uh, Julie. Um, and actually one to follow up to that, uh, is rainwater collected uh, from an asphalt roof safe? And that comes from Heidi. Okay, so here's what we recommend um, with any type of roof that you have, is keep in mind those roofs are not pristine, right? The water that hits those roofs is going to pick up anything as it runs off that's on the roof. So whatever kind of roof you have, um, it, the water coming off your roof, you cannot drink it and it's going to have stuff in it. It probably is going to have bird poop in it. It uh, is going to have dust in it. Who knows what's going to be in it? So don't drink it. Don't depend on it for anything you need sanitary water for. Um, when you water with rainwater, keep in mind good practices. Good practices are that you're not watering the top of the plant, you're watering the ground and you're keeping the water off of those leaves and things. And the other good practice is that before you eat something, what do we do, boys and girls? We wash it first, right? Why? Because all kinds of stuff could have gotten on it. Maybe the dog walked by and, you know, peed on it or something. So um, uh, all that said, are there some concerns with some roofs? Um, there can be if your roof has been treated with a fungicide, then maybe it's not something you want to do. Um, when in doubt, if you are seriously concerned, but you still want to collect the rainwater, do so, but don't use it on edible plants would be our recommendation. Always be safe. Excellent, thank you so much for that. Um, this next one comes from Charlotte B and Leah C. I'm combining these two. Uh, but do you all know of any locations to purchase native flowers slash uh, where are some of the best places to find native plants? I generally, since I work for the city, I, I generally don't give out commercial things mm -hmm. like of that nature. Um, so there are some that specialize in them and you probably just can Google that. But then I feel like I'd, I'd have to mention all of them. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I, I think you're absolutely right, Jennifer. Um, so anybody that has a favorite place, uh, Ian, if you're still out there, I know you have some favorite places, throw them in uh, the chat. Uh, we can't endorse. However, I want to give a warning out there to everybody. If it sounds too good to be true, it might be more than that. It might also be bad. So what do I mean with native plants? Be careful where you're buying already grown plants from. And you might also need to be careful about the seeds. So um, uh, I saw somebody recently asking about, ooh, somebody on Etsy had um, trilliums, I think, for sale. And that they hadn't been able to find whatever it was in, um, in the native plant nursery. So what was the deal and why was the price so good? Well, the concern there is they're digging them out of the wild mm -hmm. and depleting the wild source, uh, which is hurting the whole ecosystem. So um, make sure that when you are buying natives that you are buying from a really solid source. Now I will follow up because I get this question quite a bit about how to hire an arborist. And um, you can go to the International Society of Arboriculture. I say International Society of Arboriculture. Their website um, has a little button you press that says find an arborist and you put in your um, your zip code and then they have different levels of certification and they've gone through some extensive testing to get that so um, that's always a good source i am muted so that's not going to do um next question we have here are we allowed to have non-native plants in our smart gardens i have butterfly bushes and that comes from margaret okay are you allowed sure Yes, we, we know you're going to have a mixture of things. I have a mixture of things. Um, so what we want you to do though is carefully look at things that and check things that are not native to see if they are invasive because that is a huge problem is things that have been sold as ornamentals um, that end up being really invasive. There is a list of invasives, I may have to pull it up, but there is an invasive, do you have it, Jennifer? No, it's Mid-South Native. Mid-South Native. Invasive plant. Yeah, so look and see if it is invasive first. 
that's what we want you to do. But no, uh, the cool thing about Tennessee Smart Yards, just a quick plug for it, is that a Smart Yard can take any form. It can be tiny. We're about to put in a demonstration garden over at Metro Water Services. It's going to be two four by eight beds. And there's like one tree nearby and we're going to make it a smart yard um, because of the way we're going to do things. So it can be tiny. It can be something that is mainly ornamental. It can be something that is mainly uh, vegetables. It, it can be whatever fits your needs. Um, our big concern is that with the smart yard practices that you're gardening in a way that is not causing pollution. So yeah, and hit me up if you have more questions. Um, I know they'll be sending out our contact information too. Well, great and, question. Um, we've had a comment or two about the Wild Ones, which is an a organization. It's um, local, then it's statewide and national. And they have a lot of good resources on that types of questions on their website, the Wild Ones. Excellent. Thank you, Jennifer. And those, uh, I believe somebody provided the link to the wild ones, but if not, you can just put that in the URL of your browser. Moving along, this one comes from Lee. Uh, I live along a busy street and want to plant a little community garden so that people can pick free tomatoes and herbs as they walk by. But one concern is the effect of possible pollution from being so close to the road. Is it still worth it or could I unintentionally be causing harm? Um, yeah, yeah, I think, you know, you, you have to sort of look around at, uh, at what's going on there. There certainly is a lot of stuff that can come off of streets. Um, but the metals off of cars could splash sure. up. Sure, absolutely. In the winter, if there's ice or whatever, you could get some brine that could, you know, add salt. Um, just one note, I'm with, as you all know, Public Works, and that area right next to the street typically is the public right of way. So anything there, um, you know, could be dug up, let's say that some utility underground had to be repaired at some point. And then if you're planting trees in the public right of way, that has to go through Public Works myself um, so that we make sure that any tree doesn't cause a sight line issue. If, let's say someone's pulling out of their drive and a neighbor's planted a tree and they can't see the ongoing traffic. So there's some procedure with that. Muted again. Okay. Um, uh, quick question. Uh, is there any cost associated with uh, soil testing? There is a cost associated with soil testing and I will, and it depends on the type of test you want mm -hmm. uh, because there's a basic test um, and then there is a test that involves, well, you could do some add-on tests. Mm -hmm. um, so it's sort of a menu of tests and I will find that real quick and stick it in the chat and, for you all. And that is with the UT Extension Service where you send mm -hmm. your soil samples to that. All right, um, so while Julie finds that link, um, let's see what I have here. I just had it and I lost it. Um, are fire pit ashes good or bad for compost? No chemicals added. And that comes from Lee. Oh. What was the question? Um, it was are... about compost ashes, uh, fire pit ashes and compost. And I'll, I'll go ahead and take this one if that's all right. Yeah. And for those of you that do, I think I saw a few questions about composting. Mm -hmm. It's going to plug that we do have a whole webinar at Public Works all about how to get started composting and can answer a lot of those questions. You can also watch it on demand at that publicworkswebinars.nashville.gov. Um, but the, the ashes in your compost, so ashes, uh, fire pit ashes, if you put them in your compost, as long as you don't put a lot of them in your compost mm -hmm. bin, um, can be really good for, for your compost and for your gardens and for your soil. You just don't want to put a whole bunch of them in there. Um, so just kind of in moderation. Julie, would you say that that's about right? Yes, I'm going with you moderation. you don't want to put it directly yep. on your plants. I know it can be harmful to if you put it directly on, but you yes. can take all the good nutrients that are potentially in those ashes and you can kind of neutralize them a little bit by putting them in your compost to then use them to feed your soil rather than causing harm by putting them directly onto those, that soil and those plants, right? And, and yeah, be careful with it though. Um, as Ian pointed out yeah. in the uh, in the chat that uh, they're high in 
uh, potash, so you could absolutely yeah. end up unbalancing things. Uh, so just like everything else, it's a matter of moderation as to what put your putting in your compost. Now, if you're doing it just to get rid of it, um, in a sense, and you're going to sit everything aside for, you know, years to break down on its own, you're a little better off. But once again, make sure it's not somewhere then where all those, uh, where the rain is going to be washing through that and washing it downhill somewhere. Good point. Uh, and, and on that note, um, erosion in the woods of, on my family's farm is a big problem. What can we do? Are there any good native plants to grow there to prevent erosion? So in the woods? Uh, in the woods, yeah, yeah. So usually there's so much um, canopy in the woods that the water doesn't go. So maybe it's, it's going through and, and the woods, the floor of the woods is the perfect ideal situation. Um, you've got, you know, that leaf mold, that, that mulch built in um, there. Um, so it must be running through it somehow from a source up, up, uphill. But you can always do plants at the um, edge of the, um, smaller plants, like the button bush and other things at the edge of the woods that could help slow it down. Um, and you can always put in within the woods um, some of the um, branches that have fallen down, put them in areas to help um, slow the water down and even stones throughout it. Um, you want to be careful not to get going on some kind of invasive um, ivy or um, you know, one of those types of vines that mm -hmm. you think, oh, this is, this is going to help think of, think of mine or those types of things and then it, it takes over. Thank you for that. And um, that actually takes care of another erosion question. Um, so Jennifer, this one is for you as well. How do you feel about bare root planting, bare root planting, excuse me, for tree, shrubs, and et cetera? Well, in the ideal situation, they're ideal. Um, you know, it's easy to plant. You can carry you know, a tree like this um, that normally you couldn't lift. Um, you really have to make sure from the time it gets lifted at the nursery and all the um, dirt shaken off, if you will, that you, you know um, exactly when you're going to plant it and when that hole is going to be dug and hope that the weather cooperates. Um, so the, you don't want the roots basically to dry out. And there's some um, solution, clear solution that can cover the roots if you think it's going to be more than a few days. Um, but if it's, you know, even that two weeks max, um, if you put that clear solution on it to protect it from drying out. And even then you wanna make sure that um, it's not out in the elements, it's the wind blowing and anything that can dry that tree out. Now, having said that, you really have to make sure once you plant it that the, you stake the tree. Um, otherwise, cause it doesn't have that um, core dirt to hold it upright. The problem um, with staking in general is that people forget about it and don't go back and check and see how loose the, um, the uh, stake wire is, the guiding wire. And as over time, you probably all seen it where the, the um, branches get bigger and bigger and that wire is still around it, almost cutting that branch off or that trunk mm -hmm. off, it's quite sad. So just know that you're gonna have to stake it to, um, till it gets um, steady and you have to check it. All right, um, so it's 118. I'm probably going to do two more questions. Um, but um, Julie, Jennifer, if you wouldn't mind just sharing your information in the chat so folks, if they do have further follow-up questions, they can reach you. Um, and really putting Julie to work here because I'm going to ask her another question while she does that. Uh, I have four chickens who wander in my backyard, which is on a hill. Uh, is the chicken poop bad when it mixes in with rainwater and runs down the hill? Wow. Chicken poop. Okay, so I just have in my mind following the chickens around with little bitty bags and scooping all the poop. Or, or diaper, chicken diapers. Oh my gosh, are chicken, chicken diapers a thing? Oh my they gosh, that's, I, I get right on that, Patrick. Okay, so new business for somebody. Um, so, so here's the thing. This is once again, the matter of how many chickens, what was it for? 
Better be less than six. There you go. Four. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so it's not many chickens and considering the amount of land. And so then what are you looking at next? You're looking at, is there erosion? You know, have they pecked everything up and uh, pulled everything up such that you now have a lot of bare soil that's gonna erode, at which point they need to be running somewhere else. Um, the other thing to look at then is, is there a strip of land towards the bottom of that hill that you can leave um, uh, chicken free? And the reason is to allow that area to grow up a little bit, um, as much as you know, wherever that is, you're allowed. Don't 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 get in trouble here with uh, tall grass and weeds. But um, you want to have an area that basically gives you what we call a buffer, and it's going to act like a filter. So you have an area where you let the plants just be themselves a bit, keep the chickens out of that area. You're going to have a filter. So as that rain runs down the hill, what it picks up will be deposited there instead of continuing to run down. The problem where we have real problems with chickens is when you have a lot of chickens in a small area and a lot of runoff. The other place we have problems if you have a lot of hogs or a lot of cows and you have a lot of runoff and there is a way to compost huge amounts of cow poop and so forth. That's another fun tale for another day, I guess. <laughs> Good point, Julie. Oh, excellent point, Julie. All right, we have one more question and this one is a bit of a two-parter. Uh, I'm interested in finding the best way to remove invasive shrubs and replacing them with native while minimizing erosion. Uh, and then another part of that is um, what can you do in a wooded area where, well, you know what, answer that first part and then I'll put the second part to you. So that again is, I'm interested in finding the best way to remove invasive shrubs and replacing them with native while minimizing erosion. Well, again, just um, literally um, there are uh, <laughs> weed wrenches that you can get um, that literally, it's fairly easy to, to manipulate um, and you have to just get the, the clamp on the root and you just pull this lever which in hard and it just rips it out like I love doing it to privet. Um, and uh, that's one way of doing it. You have to stay on top of it um, every year. Just go back and keep on keeping on getting rid of the invasives mm -hmm. and then coming back once you and, and this is something um, I'm really concerned about with the ash trees loss in the woods. When those trees fall or, or snap over it's going to create some really a lot of light in the forest floor that hadn't been there and whatever's first there will get the light you know and I don't want it to be the invasive exotics um, you want it to be the native ones and a lot of that you have to be intentional and you can get um, bare root uh, little seedlings from the division of forestry and um, plant those there and you can you know fill it up as much as possible and that type of philosophy um, is that you put as many as you can in that space and you kind of leave it. This is the forestry approach. You just kind of let it be. You don't tend to go back and water it or anything else. Um, and if you get like 70% of those uh, seedlings living, then you you celebrate. That's a good thing. So um, there's, there's just different, or you can go in and get native plants and, and start and putting them through the, the forest. But at the end of the day, once you get the canopy above things, it, the understory is just not getting the light. And that's all the competition is about the light. And you have to be tenacious to get rid of the privet and honeysuckle. And, and um, that's what the weed wrangle is about. And go to their website. They've got a whole host of information about doing exactly what's been asked here. Great point, Jennifer. And you already touched off on like the part two of that. Um, are there any particular species, uh, native species that are better at keeping invasive ones from coming back? Or is that kind of more the responsibility of the, uh, the, the knowledgeable citizen to kind of just make sure those invasive species don't grow because typically they grow faster? They're very aggressive and that's the problem. And again, it gets back to who gets the light. So, um, you know, if you see something starting immediately, start getting it up if you have a small area, of course, if you have acres and acres of land. Um, another thing, uh, this is a sidebar, but it's something that just drives me crazy, so I'm gonna tell you, is the um, 
the big trees that are covered in vine, ivy, um, the euonymus, the Manh Manhattan euonymus, all these different things. And I'm asked to go out and look at the tree. Well, what do you think? I'm going, I can't even see the tree. I mean, I can't tell if it's got a, a decay area that could be a hazard, you know, that I need to know. And at some point, so many of them are so covered that they're um, preventing uh, sunlight to get to the tree so they can't photosynthesize and create the food they need. I see this particularly a lot in areas that have um, alleyways and people just let those go, if you will. And um, it's, a, it's a big issue. So if, if you have in your yard, in your smart yard, this will make it very smart, um, any vines that are starting to grow up or on it, um, go ahead and, and get that off. And sometimes you, you just have to cut a swath about two or three feet wide and it'll grow, I mean, it'll die over years above, but you really need to do that to make sure that tree is healthy and not a hazard. Sorry, yeah, I digressed. And, <laughs> and I just wanna add, you know, don't be part of the problem by accident. Um, we all have, you know, really cool computers we carry around, you know, our phones. And so, you know, what I try to do is if I'm buying a plant that I'm not completely sure of um, and have a lot of experience with, then I will look it up. And just because it's not invasive with your friends who live in another state doesn't mean it isn't going to be invasive here. Um, so look those things up, take that extra minute maybe while you're, you know, standing in line with your big cart of plants, um, you know, take that extra minute, start looking things up, um, put things aside, um, maybe consider, you know, something that is, is similar to what you liked in the thing that you found out is um, invasive or exotic, for example, and find something that is native. Oh, and I have a good example that's a tree, Jennifer. So people like the purple Japanese maples, but there's a purple red bud that uh, has sort of purple leaves that, that, you know, is a nice replacement, about the same size, um, has really cool leaves, pretty colors. So um, yeah, don't be part of the problem, y'all. Well, I think, I think that's a, oh, Patrick, are you working? <laughs> I think so, am I coming in clear? Yes, you are. Excellent, then I will be brief. And also I'm gonna take the words right out of your mouth, Jen. Uh, but I think that's a really good spot to end on. Uh, thank you, Julie. Thank you, Jennifer, for being here today. Yes. Um, and folks out there, if we weren't able to get to your questions, please just shoot those over to our experts. We'll leave the chat up for a second so you can get those emails so that way you can get this information. Um, but I just wanna say a big thank you to everyone who was able to attend today. Uh, we love having you here. I am going to include the myriad of links that we just saw in the chat in our follow-up email. Uh, let Jen or I know if you have any other further questions, subjects you want to learn more about, et yes. cetera. Uh, and don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel where you will find this recording and others recordings. Um, is there anything else, Jen? Uh, just to register for our next event on February 24th. Mm -hmm. You can um, do that on the Urban Green Lab website, on the Public Works website. Uh, we will send you a link to it as well in our follow-up email. So you will have that to sign up. Don't miss it. It's going to be great. And it's uh, going to round out our February month of Sustainable in the City Thinking Upstream. Beautiful <laughs> stuff. Uh, well done, Jen. Well done, everyone. Until the next time, take care and stay safe. Thanks for That's including all. us. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure having y'all. Go, go trees. Go trees. <laughs> <laughs>